I'm going to be talking about the integrase inhibitors. I've got a lot to say. I'm going to try to speak slow enough for the translators and quick enough to get through this material. My email address is right there, and I would be happy to send you my slides if you would like them. So just send me an email. I'll send you the slides. Okay, there are my disclosures. And here's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to talk about why the integrase inhibitors have become the favorites of all of the guidelines committees. And I'm going to talk about some differences among the drugs in the class. I'm going to share with you some of the data that has led to the selection of the integrase inhibitors as being the preferred third drug class of agents. And I'm going to discuss some new data with you as well. Since today's talk is, since all of the talks, the whole session is focused on the integrase inhibitors, I thought it would be worth taking one moment to remind you of how this amazing drug class works. So um, there is a pre-integration complex that has occurred after HIV uh, uh, reverse transcription has occurred. The DNA is inserted into the nucleus and then is bound by the integrase at the two, three, five, at the, the, the two, three prime ends. So two molecules of integrase binding to the ends of this long proviral DNA chain. The integrase then snips the cellular DNA transfers the strand of proviral DNA into our own cellular DNA uh, and then repairs any damage that occurs. The integrase inhibitors bind to the enzyme and they prevent the strand transfer event. So these drugs are called integrase strand transfer inhibitors. And these drugs have totally transformed the HIV guidelines over the last few years. If you look at the two preferred guidelines that we use in the United States, Department of Health and Human Services and the IAS USA guidelines, you can see that the DHHS guidelines have chosen as recommended agents for people starting therapy all integrase inhibitor based regimens. Bictegravir, Dalutegravir, Elvitegravir, Cobacistat, and Rautegravir. They're listed here in alphabetical order, but it's actually the re reverse in terms of the days or the times that they were approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And you can see that the DHHS guidelines gives you the leeway to choose among your nucleoside combinations a back of your 3TC only to be used with Dalutegravir, with all the other integrase inhibitors, it's tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, which I will call TDF, or tenofovir alafenamide, which I will call TAF. The newer guidelines, the ISUSA guidelines that just came out this past July in JAMA, in synchrony with the World AIDS Conference uh, that was held in Amsterdam, they've made it even simpler only three recommended initial regimens, Bictegravir, TAF, FTC, Dalutegravir, Bacavir, Lamivudine, and Dalutegravir, TAF, FTC. So I think that that's amazing. We have a lot of drugs now, but only few ones we would like to use. I think the guidelines that are even more impressive are the World Health Organization guidelines. So now, the first-line therapy that they recommend is one of two combinations, dalutegravir, two nukes, or a favorans and a couple of nukes. And I would say if it was not for these few cases of neural tube defects uh, and the need to give some flexibility to in-country guidelines that may prefer to still use a favorans because it may be a little bit less expensive in some places, I would think everybody would be recommending this regimen as the initial regimen to start people. Also, we see in second line therapy, we now see two nukes and dalutegravir being included on the list. I'm gonna share a little bit more data with you about that. So why do the guidelines like the integrase inhibitor? So 
here on this slide are a few different characteristics of drugs and how the integrase inhibitors compare with alternative regimens. Uh, and you can see for potency, I would say that the protease inhibitors, particularly these two drugs, or the NNRTIs, particularly efavirenz, these are potent drugs when used in three drug combinations. But the integrase inhibitors, I think, are even a little bit more potent. In terms of time to virologic suppression, integrase inhibitors win hands down. In terms of resistance, the newer generation drugs, dalutegravir and pictegravir, have a high barrier to resistance, maybe as high as the boosted protease inhibitors. We could debate about that. But clearly superior to what we see with the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. For convenience, they can be given once a day, generally no food restrictions, for tolerability and toxicity, arguably the best tolerated class of agents, no metabolic effects, and relatively fewer drug-drug interactions. In every category, the integrase inhibitors beats out the competition. So how does this play out in clinical practice? And I'm going to share with you some of your own data. So this is data from the Brazilian Ministry of Health that was presented uh, at the Amsterdam conference. Uh, and the objective was to estimate, to estimate the rate of virologic suppression in Brazilian starting antiretroviral therapy in this period of time, January 2014 to June 2017. People need to have a second viral load after, after initiating therapy around six months after starting therapy within uh, plus or minus 90 days. 103,000 individuals included in this analysis. You can see some of the baseline characteristics of the population. Two-thirds men, uh, median CD4 count or mean CD4 count of about 400, and viral load of 38,000. Overall, about 77% of Brazilians starting a regimen in this period of time had an undetectable viral load. But let's look at outcomes based upon the initial regimen. So the reference regimen is tenofovir 3TC efavirenz. Seventy-eight percent of the population started on that. If you look at the rate of virologic suppression in the people who get uh, dalutegravir plus TDF 3TC, 85 percent rate of virologic suppression. So higher rates of virologic suppression. Look, there's a 7% difference in the rate of virologic suppression here. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind for a moment. And if we compare the outcomes in the folks that got TDF, Dalutegravir, Lamivudine with people who get one of these two boosted protease inhibitors, well, let's choose Atazanavir. We've got a rate of virologic suppression that's about 14% better in the group that get dalutegravir. And I'll ask you to keep that number in the back of your mind, seven and 14, okay? So in this real world analysis, individuals who get an integrase inhibitor do better than people who get the alternatives. Okay, so here are the structures of the four US FDA approved integrase inhibitors. And I know when I show this, some of you are starting to check your email because you're sort of bored by the, by the figures, by the, by the chemistry. But I wanna, I'm gonna share with you some interesting information here. So let's look at the structures here and we're gonna, we're gonna see if we can match two up that look the same. Um, so here's Raltegravir, here's Elvitegravir, Dalutegravir, and Bictegravir. So if you were gonna match the two that look most similar, you would choose Dalutegravir and Bictegravir. The differences here are an extra fluorine, uh, fluorine here compared to here, a seven atom ring over here compared to a six atom ring, and instead of a methyl group here, a hydrogen. So the two next generation integrase inhibitors are really similar and therefore their properties are very similar.
cabotegravir, an experimental integrase inhibitor that's being available for oral use and as an injection, has a chemical structure that is almost identical to dalutegravir. The only difference here is a five carbon ring here or a five atom ring here compared to a six and the loss of this methyl group. So the properties of cabotegravir are gonna be really similar to the properties of dalutegravir. Now, if you have a chemistry set in your basement and you'd like to make your own integrase inhibitor, these are the things you need to include. You need to include a benzyl group at this end that has got either fluorine or chloride. This part of the molecule binds to a hydrophobic domain in the integrase enzyme. And you need to have this kind of motif. You have to have a couple of carbon-oxygen double bonds and a hydroxyl group. And the reason is that this is the part of the molecule that binds magnesium on the integrase inhibitors and really inactivates the enzyme. It's also the reason why the recommendations are for your patients to not take divalent cations, magnesium or calcium, when they take the integrase inhibitor at the same time to separate those out because theoretically that portion of these molecules can bind uh, magnesium and calcium that's given as a nutritional supplement. If we look at the differences among the drugs in this class, we'll generally point out the difference between the second generation and the first generation drugs. Uh, we've got potency across the board here, but I would argue that dalutegravir and bictegravir may be a little bit more potent than the earlier generation. We have a higher barrier to resistance with the second generation drugs compared to the first generation. Bictegravir, though, is not really usable in individuals with resistance to drug in the class. Dalutegravir has some activity. I'm sure we'll be taught, hearing about this later when Charles gives his presentation. They're all pretty convenient, although raltegravir requires you to take two pills. In the United States, we love to take medicine but we don't like to take a lot of pills. So for a lot of people, taking one pill is far superior to taking two pills. Tolerability, all of these drugs are pretty well tolerated. Um, uh, there is the need to use elvitegravir boosted by cobacystat, uh, which, which makes it a little bit more convenient, which creates more drug-drug interactions. Um, and then there's the cost. I'll just share with you the cost of these drugs in the United States, should you be curious. So let's, we'll focus on the complete three drug regimens, Genvoya, $3,300 a month, average wholesale cost. Triumec, $3,430 a month. That's the wholesale price, and Bictarvi, $3,520 a month. These drugs cost a lot of money, but let me tell you, as a resident of the United States, I am happy to spend my tax dollars to spend a lot of money to help the drug manufacturers make these drugs affordable so that they can be sold to you or the patents rights can be given to you and you can use these drugs at a less expensive price. I'm really happy about that, I, I truly am. Unfortunately, my president is not very happy about that, and we'll see what happens. Anyway, the first generation integrase inhibitors, not really much of a need to use these drugs anymore. Okay, let's talk about some studies. Um, these are the three key studies that led to the FDA approval of dalutegravir. So a comparison in the single study, dalutegravir versus efavirenz. Higher rates of virologic suppression in the people who get uh, the dalutegravir. It's an 8% difference. What was the difference between dalutegravir and efavirenz in the Brazilian study? 7%. A comparison, dalutegravir versus boosted darunavir. Dalutegravir, better virologic outcomes. What's the difference here? 12%. What was the difference in the Brazilian study? 
So your real world experience almost duplicates exactly the results of these clinical trials. I want to share with you some of the finer details so you can really appreciate, I think, the benefit of this class of drugs. Data, again, from the single study, we're comparing dilutegravir versus afavirans. You can see the time to virologic suppression much more rapidly in the people who get dilutegravir than the people who get afavirans. Half of the population or more has an undetectable viral load within the first four weeks of starting on the dilutegravir regimen. And if getting your viral load to an undetectable level is going to help prevent transmission of, of virus to an uninfected sexual partner, it's better to get your viral load undetectable quicker than slower. Also, what has been seen in all of these phase three studies, in people failing on dilutegravir, we see no integrase resistance. We have a handful of people with NNRTI resistance in the folks who are starting on afavirans-based regimens, but again, you see the advantage of using an integrase inhibitor from a resistance perspective. Here's the, that Flamingo study comparing dilutegravir versus boosted darunavir. Again, viral load reduction to an undetectable level much more rapidly in the people who get the integrase inhibitor compared to the boosted protease inhibitor. And what is even more interesting, I think, because I wouldn't have predicted this, the integrase inhibitors are outperforming the boosted protease inhibitors in the folks whose baseline viral loads are greater than 100,000. Again, arguing for the potency of this class of inhibitors. Okay, those were some studies in naive people. Now what about people who are treatment experience failing therapy? So the dawning study, these are people who are failing two nukes and generally have favorans uh, in the developing world. They have virus that's resistant, uh, but at, at least still susceptible to maybe one nuke. Generally, it's resistant to the NNRTI. So people are randomized to get two nukes and dilutegravir versus two nukes plus lopinavir, ritonavir, and people are doing better if they get the, the dilutegravir rather than the lopinavir ritonavir combination. And you can see the differences here. Um, this is intent to treat analysis, 14% difference. Very similar to what is seen in that naive study comparing the boosted protease inhibitor to the integrase inhibitor. So this, I think, is really dramatic because in the developing world, the way to sequence antiretrovirals has been two nukes and an NNRTI NNRTI generally favorans. If you develop resistance, it's two other nukes uh, and um, a boosted protease inhibitor. And now the recommendation is to choose as your second line regimen following initial failure, two nukes uh, and an integrase inhibitor. And we can look at it more details in the study. Basically in every subgroup, people are doing better if they get integrase inhibitors. Uh, it's true if the viral load is lower. Uh, that there's no benefit here if the viral load is high, but if people have a, a, a viral load of greater than 100,000 while failing on therapy, they're probably not taking their regimen at all, and that probably accounts for that. People are doing better on the dilutegravir irrespective of the number of other active drugs they receive or the CD4 count. Uh, and if you look at treatment emergent resistance, it's no resistance in the people who are getting dilutegravir and a couple of nukes. Um, you don't see any PI resistance in the people who are failing on lopinavir, ritonavir, although you do see some people with nuke resistance. Okay. If we look among the integrase inhibitors, if we compare dilutegravir to raltegravir in people with virologic failure, we see superior outcomes in the people who are on the second generation drugs. So this is a study Again, people with virologic failure on a regimen, no integrase in inhibitor resistance. People are randomized to get dilutegravir uh, or raltegravir plus an optimized background regimen, usually with boosted darunavir uh, and other nukes chosen by the investigators. Uh, and not surprisingly, people do better if they are getting the second generation integrase inhibitor 
as compared to the first generation integrase inhibitor, more virologic failure on rautegravir uh, than dalutegravir. And if we look by week 48, uh, at the rate of virologic failure, 12% in the rautegravir group uh, and half of that rate in the people who get dalutegravir. So there's a lot to say about integrase resistance, and Charles Boucher is going to tell you more about it. I'm not going to say anything else. So let me share with you some data about Bictegravir. I, I know that this drug may not be available to you at this point in time, but you should at least know what's up uh, with this drug. So I'll share with you data from two different studies. Uh, this is a study that compares um, uh, Bictegravir, TAF, uh, and FTC versus Dalutegravir, Abacavir, and Lamivudine. So these would be the two single, complete, second-generation integrase inhibitor-based regimens uh, that we have available to us. Uh, and you can see that the proportion of individuals with virologic success uh, is about the same. There was a difference in the study. The only real difference in the study was that there was a little bit more nausea uh, in the people who got the abacavir-containing regimen. And that nausea was due to abacavir rather than dalutegravir. And the reason why I can tell you that is because of this study. This is a study that compares Bictegravir TAF FTC versus Dalutegravir TAF FTC. So now we're comparing the integrase inhibitors head to head, and it really doesn't matter uh, what nukes individuals get. And you see similar rates of virologic suppression in both groups, uh, and you see no difference in nausea in the people who are in the study. So in that earlier study, nausea was due to the abacavir. Let me say a few words about adverse events. Keep in mind that when you start a dalutegravir-based regimen, you are going to see an in increase in creatinine. This is that single study. When people start on dalutegravir or bictegravir, these drugs compete for the distal renal tubular secretion of creatinine. And therefore, creatinine levels go up, GFR goes down. You're going to see that predictably in the people who get these drugs. So don't let that scare you. There is a fair amount of data that suggests that dalutegravir, perhaps more than the other drugs in the class, are associated with an increased risk of neuropsychiatric abnormalities. The one that I see most often in my clinical practice is sleep problems. But there are other psychiatric, uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms that some people complain about. You're going to hear more about neural tube defects. Um, you're not going to hear it from Rebecca Zash, though. You're going to hear it from Maro Schechter because she missed her flight, and Maro is going to give her presentation. I understand he's going to be dressed in drag when he does that. <laughs> okay, a little bit of newer data. Two drug combinations. This is really exciting. The notion that dalutegravir plus lamivudine may be as effective as dalutegravir plus a couple of nukes. Uh, and you see from these two studies, Gemini 1 and Gemini 2, that there is no difference. There is non-inferiority in these outcomes, strongly suggesting in these large studies that a second-generation integration inhibitor plus lamivudine may be as effective as a three-drug combination. If you look at time to virologic suppression, there is no difference. And if we looked at a decline in viral load, there would be no difference between two drugs and three drug regimens. Uh, and you can see durable response over a 48-week period of time. It's pretty impressive. If you look at subgroup analyses, you see people doing just as well in the two drug combinations if their viral load is high or if the viral load is low. There is a little bit of difference in the people whose CD4 counts are lowish. But the reason for this difference here has nothing to do with virologic failure. It has to do with other reasons why individuals discontinue therapy. I think the treatment guidelines ultimately will have to endorse a two-drug combination, perhaps not in people with low CD4 counts, but in everybody else. And there's no resistance that's seen in anybody across the board. There's going to be data, more data to come at CROI this coming year about switching therapy from a three-drug combination to a dalutegravir-lamivudine two-drug combination. There's this smaller Aspire pilot study 
uh, with about 45 individuals in each arm, but you can see over a 48 week period of time, if people continue on their three drug combination in blue uh, and, or, or switch to dilutegravir lamivudine in purple, no difference in rates of virologic suppression. We have other data that shows that two drug combinations are going to work. We have the SWORD studies. So the SWORD studies compared continuing a three drug combination in individuals with virologic suppression or switching to a two drug combination of dalutegravir rilpivirine. And what was seen is there's absolutely no difference. 95% rate of virologic suppression in people who continue on three drugs or switch to two. And what is even more exciting is this injectable long-acting drug, cabotegravir. So let me share with you some data from this latte study. So individuals start on oral cabotegravir, abacavir, lamivudine. If they do well over a 20-week period of time and they have an undetectable viral load, they add rilpivirine. Uh, and then when they get the viral load back that's been done at week 20, if it is in fact undetectable, they're randomized to go back to the three drug oral regimen or to get injectable cabotegravir and rilpivirine, either once every four weeks or once every eight weeks. So these are given as two injections in the nadagas. Nadagas is now my favorite Portuguese word. And who does the best? The people who get the shots in the nadagas. The people who, do, who are on oral therapy do not do as well. And I, I'm always tempted, and so I will, I will succumb to my temptation, to ask the audience, what is their preference? So, what would you rather do? I wanna see you show me by raising your hands. Would you rather take one pill a day or get two shots in the nadagas every two months? So how many of you would rather take one pill a day? How many of you want two shots in the nadagas? <laughs> that is always what I thought about Brazilians, I want you to know. <laughs> All right. One more study and then I'm done. What about treat treating TB co-infection. So here's a study we're comparing dalutegravir versus efavirenz in individuals with TB co-infection. Individuals start on the four drug TB regimens and then either between two weeks and two months after being diagnosed with tuberculosis and starting on four drug therapy, individuals start on their antiretrovirals. They're getting dalutegravir twice a day because of drug-drug interactions with the rifampin. They continue on dilutegravir twice a day for two weeks after individuals complete their TB therapy, and then they're followed. And you see similar rates of virologic suppression in the people who get dilutegravir or the people who get efavirenz. But what about immune reconstitution syndrome? Are you more likely to see immune reconstitution syndrome because the viral load is reduced more quickly in the people who get integrase inhibitors? And the answer is no, you don't. You see exactly the same rates of, uh, or close to the same rates of uh, immune reconstitution uh, in individuals who get dilutegravir or efavirenz. It's not more severe, it just occurs maybe a little bit earlier. So, in conclusion, Integrase inhibitors have transformed the HIV treatment landscape. We've got excellent drugs in the class, but some are more excellent than others. And there's a lot more to come. Thank you very much.